Welcome everybody to our second Global Tea Hut video. I'm here with Andy, who's our center doctor, and we're going to talk about August Global Tea Hut. Yeah, thanks, Uda, for inviting me to the table. I'm happy to be part of uh, this month's uh, video and, and uh, talk about uh, this month the uh, Taiwanese oolong tea. Yeah. Why don't we dive right in with this month's tea, which is a, a Tsuiyu oolong. So this month, as you can see, we're preparing tea uh, Gong Fu style, as opposed to last month we were brewing bowl tea. And uh, last month we talked a little bit about the difference between the two. We can maybe talk a little bit more about that. This tea, we're going to brew Gong Fu because this is an oolong tea and oolong and gong fu basically were born together so they very much go together so preparing oolong tea any other way than gong fu would, would seem strange because they, they kind of grew up together gong fu tea brewing started 300 350 years ago in the Qing dynasty it arose uh, in southern China out of you know martial arts traditions and uh, with the same kinds of principles that martial arts traditions have of, of internal cultivation principles of, of Wu Wei and of grace and refinement the word gong fu means skill means mastery it means doing things uh, the way that they want to be done. So there's a sense in which you brew tea Gong Fu style. You brew tea the way that it wants to be brewed rather than the way that you want to brew it. And I think all, mastery of all art is like that. You, you master an art by understanding the medium, by becoming the medium, by working with the medium in the way that it wants to be worked with. The classic example, of course, is Michelangelo saying that his sculptures were already in the marble and he just removes all the excess pieces. Whereas bowl tea is about simplicity and uh, connection to nature and less of the human stuff in tea and more just about the kind of spiritual aspect of just sitting with a bowl of tea. You can see that it's, it's even there in our body because when we drink bowl tea, we're, we're using large motor skills. We're using big muscle groups. We're using bigger chunks of our body at once and, and less of it. And when we brew gong fu tea, we're using fine motor skills. So we're more uh, in tune and, and refined. Gong Fu tea definitely brings out um, the highest potential in the tea. So the idea is, is to um, respect the tea by brewing it in a way that uh, maximizes its potential, brings the most out of it. So it's not about uh, brewing it in a way that, that you want to, but about listening to the tea and, and figuring out what's the ideal way to help it to reach its potential. And that way you honor all the work that went into the production of that tea and into um, the, the preparation of it as well. And oolong tea, obviously the processing is more complicated than any other kind of tea. So it makes sense that um, that much work went into the processing of this tea that we would want to also prepare it in a way that meets that and, and brings, the, brings that out. Oolong tea is uh, different than Pu'er Pu'er, it's more about the trees, but uh, with Oolong tea, it's at least half as much about the skill of the one processing as it is about the, the tea trees. Yeah, we had a conversation uh, with uh, one of our potter friends from Taiwan, Peter, and uh, here yesterday at the center, and we had that conversation about uh, craftsmanship oh. and how it's uh, kind of a lost art and skill. And, and here in Taiwan, um, <clears throat> from food to uh, pottery to tea, uh, they really uh, carry on that tradition of uh, fine craftsmanship. And that's really apparent in the oolong, like you said, where it's uh, a lot of the, uh, the taste and the work comes out uh, through the processing. Western people often have a, a, a misunderstanding about mastery, that it's about control. The word, I think, even implies that in English, the, the master is the boss. So there's an idea that kind of mastery is, uh, is about controlling something, but nothing could be further from the truth. Because as, as far as tea goes, every, uh, every year, every season is different. Mm. So the, you know, the farmers, they have to, uh, the weather's different, so they really have to, uh, they can't control the plant mm. in that respect. That's not really what mastery is about anyway. Mastery in anything, whether it's athletics or art or uh, tea, mastery is when you, when you connect to that place in you that meets the universe and you, and you act from that. And then 
you have the current of the universe behind you. You have the power and force of the world coming through. You have the higher intelligence in you that's coming through what you're doing. And athletes speak about that. They speak about being in the zone. And, you know, it means that, you know, when that was happening, they weren't there. If their mind was there, if they were thinking too much, if they were, you know, even thinking about what they were doing, they wouldn't be able to, to do it. It's not a decision-making process. It happens, you could say, freely, or it comes from a, a place of instinct or intuition. And, uh, you know, they asked a master ballerina once, how do you perform so beautifully? And she said, when I'm on stage, there's no me and there's no music. There's only dance. So I think that that's very much the spirit of Gong Fu Ti is that it's about um, the brewer becoming part of the process, the process that started with the seed and came into the tree and then the processing of the tea, that's the, one of the first kind of Gong Fu. And then in the preparing of the tea, that's the second kind of Gong Fu and the tea reaches its fulfillment. The tea is very sweet, has um, hints of kind of almost tender seaweed and um, edamame. And uh, besides the beans, there's also some uh, floral elements too. The aroma is very, very floral. Mm. So another, another difference between uh, oolong and, and pu'er is the way in which they enter our subtle body. So when we drink oolong, we want to take as small sips as possible. In fact, the original Gong Fu cups were, were very small, which forced you to take little teeny sips. Whereas pu'er, it's much better if we drink it in a, in a big cup or a bowl and we take big gulps because it actually it comes down and goes into our stomach and then it enters our subtle body through the stomach and the chest. Oolong um, moves upward. So it enters, through, um, uh, you could say, through the nasal cavity and upward it goes into our subtle body through there. It becomes chi through, through this way. So there's, that's why there's, some people even use aroma cups. So there's, there's a lot in the aroma of oolong, in the fragrance, in the upward moving energy. So when you take small sips, it, help, it helps that process. You, not only will you enjoy the tea more because it'll be more aromatic and flavorful, but it also will um, have more chi when you drink it that way. So you can give it a try. Okay. That's great. That's what I love about tea is that, uh, you know, we use these different brewing methods that match the, the type of tea it is and uh, use different cups or bowls uh, to match maybe the, the chi of the tea and, and how that has different effects on our body. And even how, how we uh, take in the tea and, and feel the chi of the tea. Yeah. It's, a, it's such an amazing world that you can't explore in lifetimes. There's just so much to, to learn and to experience and on all levels. Uh, there's, you know, sometimes a misconception that, that we have to choose the tea's spirituality or it's a beverage or, or it's a, a hobby or it's a sensual pleasure. But I think in, the, in that instance, or is a kind of dirty word, it's, it's not helpful. It's much better to insert a, a very healthy and into that statement. So we could say that tea is spirituality and it's a beverage and it's a hobby and it's a sensual experience. And it's all of those things. And they're all wonderful and worth exploring in their own right and at different times and different places. Each one has its, has its place. So this month's issue is a lot about uh, tea varietals in Taiwan and the history of that and understanding some of the basics that go into the varietals of, of Taiwanese tea. Uh, essentially, m most of the tea that was brought to Taiwan was brought here by Fujianese people, um, you know, in different waves starting s several hundred years ago, uh, 300 around. And uh, they mostly brought tea from, from Wuyi Mountain. And when they came over, you know, they probably came to Taiwan and they recognized that Taiwan had the right terroir for, for tea. And remember, terroir means uh, the soil, the climate, the 
culture, all of the things that, that make tea what it is. It's actually a French word that is related to wine, but we've uh, been using it in tea dialogues now for, for many years. So they probably came, they noticed that the, the Taiwanese uh, terroir was really excellent for growing tea, the right kind of humidity, the mist, the volcanic soil that's loose and gravelly is a great place to grow tea. And so they brought over uh, several varieties from, from Wuyi. None of the really famous varietals, like the four uh, fam most famous kinds of cliff tea, what are called the Sidamin, Da Hong Pao, Te Lo Han, and uh, Shui Jing Gui, and Bai Ji Guan. They couldn't bring over any of the real famous varietals because those were protected by the people in Wuyi. So they brought over a lot of uh, lesser known varietals. And uh, there's a dozen or so that are still around today. But there's one that, that when they brought it over, it was most suitable for, for Taiwan. It really, it really fit in in Taiwan. And that, that's, that one's called Qing Xing, which means uh, gentle heart or tender heart, oolong. And uh, that's the most famous uh, tea in Taiwan nowadays. The most of what you see that's high mountain oolong tea is all Qingxin. It was brought here but f uh, from Wuyi. Of course, over these centuries, it's, it's adapted and become um, something very much Taiwanese. And even gone from Taiwan back to China and to Vietnam and, and other places like uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So. Qingqing Qing oolong represents the, the majority of, of high mountain oolong and a lot of the oolongs that make Taiwan famous. There are a few other varietals that were brought from China, traditional classic varietals that still exist, um, that, that, that are around, uh, like some of the varietals used for ori oriental beauty in uh, Beipu and Miaoli County here, and uh, to the Taiwanyin varietal that's in Muta, etc. But Qingxing is definitely the one that um, Taiwan has become famous for. And then there are the three daughters of Taiwan, as they're called, which are the three uh, tea trees that were born here in Taiwan. They're very much Taiwanese varietals. Two of them were man-made. So they're hybrids that are produced um, by the Taiwan Research Association, which was began in uh, um, when the Japanese were in control of Taiwan and then continued after they left. And uh, those two varietals, one of them is called Jingxuan, which is uh, golden lily. It has a milk fragrance. And the other one is our tea of the month, Yu, which means kingfisher jade. Kingfisher is a kind of bird, has blue-green feathers. And uh, there's a jade that's kind of that blue-green. And Chinese people have always traditionally loved that color, especially in jade. And the tea trees of Cui Yu, as you can see in the pictures in the magazine, they have a kind of uh, bluish tint to them, as do the leaves. Mm. So that's where it gets its name. Um, the third distinctly Taiwanese varietal is called Siji Chuan, which means four seasons of spring. It isn't a man-made one. It, it's a natural varietal that actually arose in Muza. It's related to the to to Taiwanian, and uh, because it's a naturally arising varietal, it's much more hardy than the man-made hybrids Jingxuan and Zuiyu. So it's it uh, produces more tea. It's more hardy. It grows, and it it can produce tea all four seasons. In fact, they can even get, in some places, in lower altitudes, they can get five or six harvests a year from Suji Chuan. Oh, wow, that's, that's very rare for a tea. Yeah. Oh, that only happens in lower altitudes. Um, but uh, Suji Chuan's a more hardy plant because it's natural. And of course, you know, nature produces better than what can be made by the hands of man. But Tseyu is a, is a hybrid, a varietal, that probably took 60 to 80 years to produce. It, um, it has a, a magic of its own. And in the past, we've sent Qingxing Oolong, and we've sent Suji Chuan. Just last year, we sent Suji Chuan out. And uh, we hope in the future to also send Jing, Jingxuan, and then you'll have drank all the three daughters of Taiwan, and you can, you can uh, compare them. So, so I use a, a special tea that is uh, distinctly Taiwanese. And uh, 
Of course, the region with the most Tseyu is, is Mingjian Nantou, which is where our dear friend Mr. She's farm is. And this tea is, is uh, donated by Mr. She, who has donated so many teas to Global Tea Hut over the years. He, and is uh, such an amazing man. When any of you come and visit us, you'll have the opportunity, if you like, to go to his farm and even make some tea if you like. He, uh, his tea is organic and we've, we've discussed his story many, many times in the magazine. He um, noticed some detrimental uh, health effects to his family from pesticides and he switched. And uh, at first he didn't really know what he was doing and his tea wasn't really that great when it was organic and he, he had to go through some years of suffering. He even had a job as a painter as he was also farming tea. And um, eventually though he became successful and uh, he's now also very busy converting his neighbors and others in his community to organic farming methods, training them freely. Um, they've also formed a co-op so that some of their tea can be sold collectively, which encourages farmers to join and to become organic because they get free training and they get an outlet to sell their tea through through the co-op. So he's converted a few dozen farmers to organic in his region. He's a really beautiful man that loves the earth and loves tea and his spirits very much in, in this tea and the other teas that we've sent to you guys. Please. Oh, thank you. That's what I like about uh, the center, how a lot of the the local farmers and, and potters um, that we have relationships with, uh, they're friends. It's not just uh, some business relationship. You know, we get to know them, and they're uh, we get to know their story, and, and you know, they come and visit the center, and it's a it's a really great relationship, and they're really, really great people, uh, like Mr. Shea and and uh, some of our other friends, like Peter, that was just here uh, yesterday. Yeah, that and that, you know, that's a really important aspect that this, this global tea hut is very much has this kind of family uh, feeling and, and orientation to it. And <clears throat> it's mutually beneficial because these farmers, uh, you know, not all of them are donating because they necessarily understand everything that we're doing as we approach tea primarily as, an, as a means of spiritual cultivation. And they maybe are just simple farmers. But one thing they do understand is that through us, their tea goes out to 30 countries. And uh, that, you know, they're going against the grain. Organic farming is hard work. Not just in the sense that it's hard work as in physical labor. It's hard work in that you're, you're going against the mainstream market. You know, the mainstream market of the world today isn't isn't yet healthy. The mainstream uh, agriculture, the mainstream food, the mainstream supermarkets is, is uh, Coca-Cola and other things. It's not organic, healthy, uh, properly grown, sustainable agriculture. So these guys are going against the grain and, and it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work, especially if you want to involve others in your community like Mr. Shea wants to. And so by you know getting themselves out, they're 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 promoted, and uh, we're very happy to to promote them. We want that to continue. We want to find new ways to do that. When we build our new center, we hope to have um, gatherings where we can we can pay to bring different organic farmers from China and Taiwan and Korea and Japan and bring them and let them have uh, meetings and gatherings with each other and. You know, they'll know what to discuss with each other. We won't have to set their schedule up. They'll know what they need to talk about. We'll just provide the space. But uh, we hope to be able to promote more and more um, farmers who are growing tea in a sustainable way. It's really important because um, if you use tea as a means to connect to nature, uh, how can you utilize tea that it's, is itself grown in a way that is harming nature? So even if you do connect to nature through that tea, the message back is just going to be that you're destroying me. I think now more than ever, that's imperative. So I'm often invited to go and speak at uh, forums or expos or gatherings here in Taiwan. And I always say the same thing. People there, you know, they want to talk about chashi, they want to talk about teaware, they want to talk about tea and tea culture, tea processing, tea roasting. And I'm interested in all of that. 
but I feel like it's not primary right now. That uh, when the environment's in danger and tea production itself is in danger, not immediate danger like in the next few years, but maybe in the next few generations, then all of those points are kind of moot because if there's no tea, then how to talk about tea culture or tea ware or, or chashi or these things, they're all irrelevant. Uh, the analogy that I use is if, you're par if, you're, if you have two parents and their, their child is sick, uh, when, I, when your child's sick, you don't, you, you don't discuss their hairstyle or what kind of clothes they're to wear or what classes you want to take them to and sign them up for. None of that's important. The only thing that matters is, is medicine and healing and fixing their, their problem. All of that comes later. And it feels like right now there's a little bit of a pressure on us, uh, the tea lovers alive now, in the sense that all, all of the tea traditions going back so many thousands of years, all those masters are kind of, you could say, figuratively looking at us and wondering why we're going to allow this to end. And then we also have the pressure of all the future tea lovers who may not have tea because uh, tea production now is, is uh, being conducted in a very unsustainable way. So it's very important to promote sustainable tea production um, and farmers like Mr. Shea. And what I really like about th this month's issue is that, you know, because there's so much information to know about tea and uh, being here in Taiwan, uh, trying to understand so much about oolong tea, it's, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, this really, uh, this issue kind of gave the big picture of oolong tea and, and uh, you know, let us know about the four, uh, the four varietals that you wrote about. Um, I said uh, two of them were handmade. One of them was this month's tea, the Tsuiyu, and the other one was the Golden Ali uh, Jingxuan. Yes. What exactly does that mean, uh, that the tea was... Man-made, yeah. Well, man-made uh, just means that, that they're, they're hybrids. So uh, they were, they were cross-pollinated and genetic pressure was put on to produce a certain kind of tea tree. So, so they, they uh, use selection as, they, as farmers do in, in any form of agriculture. They, they use selection and then they uh, pick out uh, qualities that they want and over generations in that way um, promote those qualities. Um, uh, pest resistance, in that time they were, they were maybe, you know, obviously they didn't know, but maybe in some ways they were foreseeing the future and the problems uh, that we have now. Um, at least it's, it's fun to discuss it in that way. But uh, in those days, they didn't have uh, access to pesticides, so they were looking to um, breed um, uh, pest, more pest-resistant uh, hybrids, uh, uh, certain flavors and aromas. Um, it could be all, any kind of thing. So um, these these hybrids are uh, man-made in that sense, in the sense that they're they're uh, they were cross-pollinated. They were created over decades. Okay. Whereas Siji Chun is a, just a natural arising varietal that uh, happened on its own in Muta. Well, so for, for all the work that went in, all the time to make these hybrids, I'd hope that uh, in the future all this, they're going to, uh, you know, Taiwan puts that work to an energy into uh, making clean tea. Uh, because in, uh, you know, Taiwan, the very steep mountains here, uh, it's a big issue, uh, using yes. pesticides on the, on the tea. Yeah. And, you know, not all tea in the world can be living tea, which is seed propagated and has room to grow up and uh, uh, is biodiverse and, and has proper relationship with the farmer and nature. That, those are the qualities of what we call living tea. <clears throat> but if all tea was produced in that way, there wouldn't be enough tea for millions of people in the world. So we need some plantation tea. But at least it should be clean and, and sustainable and produced in a way that's not harmful to the earth. Because, um, <clears throat> you know, right now in the world, I often ask people, especially young people, I like to ask them, you know, is it healthy to have a desire for things you can't afford? And the obvious answer that most sane people will say is no, that's not healthy for me. And I think that that's kind of where we're at as a species too. There's a lot of luxuries that we can no longer afford. 
Right? Do, you th do you think right now that the, the state the world's in, that we can afford luxuries that destroy nature? You know, maybe we never could. But now especially, things are reaching a, a critical point. And uh, paradoxically, things are getting both better and worse at the same time. The like dysfunction is is amplifying, but the like the the healing and the source and the medicine and the connection to nature and the new policies and the great farmers that are changing dozens of their neighbors that stuff's also increasing. Um, and so ultimately, for me, it's not about some goal-oriented uh, campaign to save the world. It's about that you know being aligned with the medicine, being aligned with the uh, the power for good is is a reward in and of itself, and I would do it for its own sake. So it's not really a battle to win. It's just more that um, that's in, in in harmony with the spirit of tea. If you're going to live a life of tea, you should live in harmony with the spirit of tea. And the spirit of tea is one of connection to nature, and of course, the love of nature, because that's the ultimate question that I ask anyone is how do you love a leaf without loving nature right whatever you love about tea i don't care what you love about tea you love uh the the chemicals in it you this person's a chemist and he loves the uh the antioxidants and the and the way that it, it can uh, cause some health benefits for him and she is a sensualist she loves all the flavors and aromas and exotic tastes in tea and I'm a spiritualist, and I love the peace that surrounds tea, and the ability to connect me to other people uh, and on a heart level. So we all love different things about tea, but whatever you love about tea got into that leaf through the stem, through the branch, through the trunk, through the roots, through the soil, through the sun. So how do you love a leaf without loving the nature that made it? And that insight, actually, you can apply that to, to almost anything. You can, you know, ask a mother, how do you love your child without loving water when your child's body is 70-some percent water, right? How do you love your child and not love the water that composes 70-some percent of their physical being? So we can apply that wisdom to all, all areas of life, but it's particularly pertinent when the thing that you love and adore is a leaf, is a product of nature, right? How do you say you love it, but you don't care that it's destroying nature? Or you, don't, you love tea, but you don't care that in the future people may not have tea because it's being grown in an unsustainable way and the land's going to stop giving. Well, speaking about life practices that are uh, doing good for the earth and uh, you know doing good for for uh, mankind, uh, Max uh, wrote a, a really great article uh, brought to life um, Hope Market and uh, what the Tea Sage Hut uh, participates in every month. And Tai Jong, can you kind of? Tell us, uh, tell us about Hope Market and... Yeah, I mean, uh, Hope Market interestingly ties into all this because that's where we met Mr. Shea. Hope Market is uh, not just a market, it's an organization of people that are committed to uh, a love for nature and the earth. There's people that produce clothes out of recycled cloth that's discarded. There's people that uh, produce honey or fruit or organic vegetables. Uh, and they all help each other, so it's a community. Um, they have uh, communal labor so that if the if Mr. Shea needs help picking tea, everybody will come help. And then if a few weeks later the guy who makes tofu needs help making tofu, they'll all show up. And there's no money exchanged between any of the members. So they, um, they barter with each other in a really happy way. And they have activities that are going on all month long. They have training seminars. You can go on Tuesdays and learn about honey or how to make tofu, etc. cetera. Um, but then once a month they have a, a market and uh, uh, for the past several years they've given us a booth and we go there and just serve tea to passers-by and roadside tea is very much a part of our tradition and uh, the aim of the roadside tea isn't to teach anything or promote anything or uh, e even to discuss our tradition uh, what we do is we try to create a, a space of presence and loving kindness and serve tea to passers-by and that's it you could say we're holding space and they can do whatever they want with that space some people want to chat 
Some people want to ask questions, sometimes questions about life wisdom, sometimes just casual questions about where you're from and what's your name and, you know, being friendly. And uh, other times they ask uh, deeper questions. And then sometimes they just want to sit in silence and enjoy the space and be present. It's very common for passers-by to, to walk by and notice us and, and find us interesting and then sit down and then uh, stay all day. We've even had several times where somebody will come and they'll sit down and they'll have a bowl and then they'll say, I have to go, I got a meeting or something and they leave and then like 20 minutes later we see them come back and they say, oh, I canceled my meeting and they end up sitting there for a few hours just because it's really peaceful and, and good space. And so I think that the other booths in Hope Market, they're doing all kinds of like active outward things to change the earth. But, uh, you know, it's very important for us all to remember that the earth doesn't have weather problems or climatic problems or, or environmental problems. The earth only has one problem and that's a people problem. If there weren't people in this world, uh, very quickly, big cities like Taipei or New York would be covered in green, and tigers would be walking down the main, the main road. Their uh, nature would recover very quickly. And similarly, uh, people, the people problem of this world isn't distilled into economic problems or political problems. The solutions aren't political. Our problem is also is heart-based. We have a heart problem. And so uh, we need healing in our hearts as individuals and then the more individuals that are healed in that way then as a society. And so we kind of bring that internal dimension to the hope market. They're doing all the stuff like recycling and organic and that, you know, to some that's more important. It might be, but we bring the heart shift, which is also important because uh, I think that, you know, how you do things, how you orient towards life has as much influence on this world as what you do. It's kind of like when we evaluate a waitress in a restaurant, right? What makes an exceptional waitress? If there's three waitresses and they all bring your food on time and none of them drop anything and then none of them, you know, they all do their job perfectly, which is the one that stands out to you? And so that's kind of what we bring to, to Hope Market is that kind of in, the internal spiritual element to meet their external uh, work, their physical work. And by, uh, by service as a way to um, be more hurtful. And, and that's one of the things that uh, you know, TSA taught here is that uh, how everybody here is uh, in service of the guests and um, in service of the members and, and writing the magazine. And uh, that's one of the things I love about Hope Market is that it's uh, you guys are providing a service to the community. It's, it's, you're donating your time and energy and, and, and uh, don't ex accept any money for the tea. Mm. Just doing it out of uh, a heart space, which is really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, that's the spirit of this place. It's all donation based and um, people can stay here at the center and all the room and board and teaching and, and tea is all free. And then, then there's a donation box and they can give whatever they like um, from from a little to a lot. As it says in the magazine, there are some words carved on our donation box, which we you know, take out with us, but it's also here all the time. And it says, it's an old uh, Japanese saying that's very important to our tradition. And uh, the words are, uh, the price of this tea is anything from one cent to 1,000 in gold. Otherwise it's free. I only wish I could give it to you for less. And that kind of uh, encapsulates the spirit of tea sage hot, both here and when we're out serving tea. Um, and that is an element that Max mentioned even, that we're the only booth maybe in the market that isn't really selling anything. We're just there to, to be and offer space and, and kindness and hospitality and uh, presence and, and tea. So you mentioned earlier about uh, how tea has a way to connect uh, with people from in so many different ways. And our tea wayfarer this month, uh, Sabina, was uh, really special to have her here yeah. last month. And, and she was someone that uh, really connected to tea yeah. uh, from her first meeting. From, right from the first. Uh, Sabina, uh, a few years ago, we did this uh, yoga festival called Tadasana. 
And we served tea there. We had a tent, a tea tent there. We served hundreds of people over the course of this weekend. And so many of the people that we drank tea with that weekend uh, are still in touch. And many of them have been here. And many of them are now dear friends, if not brothers and sisters. So it was actually a very special weekend in, in many, many ways. There's just a really good energy there. And Sabina was one of the people that I met there. And uh, right from the beginning, um, from the first bowl that we shared together, we were already... Um, brother and sister and I knew that she would come here sometime and I saw her many times um, on her side of the pond and then recently she she came here so it seemed right to make her the tea wayfarer. She's a meditation teacher and now she's um, incorporating tea ceremony into her meditation. She's also an Ayurvedic uh, healer uh, similar to how you're a Chinese doctor and she's uh, figuring out ways to incorporate tea into the, her sessions with her clients also so yeah, one of the great things about tea wafer that I love is just to see all the ways that tea is expressing itself into the world right so there's like the tea practice and the sharing of tea through ceremonies but then like tea people cha jin they're called right cha jin are taking the tea spirit and applying it to art and business and Ayurvedic medicine and meditation and all these other uh, places where tea is, is going is uh, inspiring and uh, beautiful. Yeah, because you, you, don't, you don't have to know all the ins and outs of the tea industry and the tea culture and, and the tea arts. It's just uh, uh, sharing the tea, sharing um, you know, leaves, leaves in the bowl. You know, our most, our most uh, basic brewing method. Yeah. Sharing space. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something, uh, there's definitely something, there's an access point for everybody from the simple brewing of just putting leaves in a bowl all the way to Kung Fu tea and all of the refinement and mastery that goes into that practice and, and everything in between. And uh, for me, ideal is to have a balance of all of that. The simple and the equanimous and the um, and the sensitive and refined as well, so that the skills are there, but I'm not dependent on them and I'm not pretentious because a lot of skill without connection to the spirit of just like you said leaves and water, and you just become a snob and you miss out on on the connection that happens through tea because you're uh, you know worried about judging people and their skill or judging tea wear and tea isn't always about that sometimes it's about friendship it's about an act of kindness it's about uh, sharing space and time with somebody and uh, connecting to them and uh, sometimes it's about connection to nature sometimes it's about connection to self and uh, other times it's about refinement and practice so that's why you know every issue we have uh, articles that kind of cover all these aspects of tea. So in this issue you have articles about the linear stuff so you can learn about the varietals of tea in, in Taiwan and uh, other aspects of tea but then we also have Gong Fu tea tips so you can do experiments and practice and improve your Gong Fu brewing and then we have articles that are dealing with the more spiritual side of tea so it's our aim to cover the entire uh, world of tea and I don't think any other tea magazine that's out there now or, or ever has uh, done that, has captured the entire gamut from the linear information through the art and teaware all the way to the spiritual stuff. So I think maybe one of the smallest parts of Global Tea Hut uh, may be one of the most special and that's the little gift that is sent every month uh, along with the magazine in the in the tea so this month we have these uh, special little stones and yeah. can you elaborate on yeah that? these are called the medicine stones my fan and uh, they uh, these ones come from Taiwan you can also get ones that come from China uh, they're really good for tea tea is obviously you know 98% water so you improve your water is the easiest way to improve your tea um, and uh, these will help. They, they soften water and uh, they mineralize it. They'll even dissolve slowly over years and they clean and purify it too. So you can rinse them off and put them out in the sun every couple of weeks and then they'll help to purify your water. And you can put them in your water jar. You can even put them in the kettle. And uh, you should do an experiment. 
try brewing a tea that you're familiar with and then the next day put the stones in there and brew the same tea and, and uh, see for yourself but they can have a, a positive impact on a lot of uh, water in the world so they're a good gift because they'll improve the tea of everybody in in Global Tea Hut and what could be better than that. It's been great chatting again and having Andy here and talking about the August Global Tea Hut. We're going to continue these videos in future months. If you have any questions, you can email us at globalteahut at gmail.com and we'd be happy to discuss anything you like in the coming videos. Buddha, thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for making some, some great tea. Really enjoyed the, this month's uh, Tsuayu. Yes, it's been a great month. And uh, for those new members, welcome to Global Tea Hut. And uh, for the rest of you, uh, thank you for all your support in the previous months. And we look forward to seeing you again next month.